uh, scooters, motorcycles, kind of the same thing. Uh, I have a motorcycle at home myself. Um, and these are just some of the companies that I have uh, had the privilege of working for. Feel free to follow me on Twitter if you're interested in listening to my uh, crazy uh, rants about OpenStack and the positive light. Um, and, uh, of course, my blog as well, as I have some really good blog posts on some automation things you can do with OpenStack. So feel free to follow me there. So we're going to get into the meat and the potatoes. I think I'm stepping on something. I am. Um, kind of the meeting of the potatoes are some of the talking points uh, that we're going to review today. We're going to talk about some of the common cloud decisions you need to make um, uh, when actually thinking about automating around uh, cloud. Uh, learn why OpenStack and uh, automation work well together. Uh, review some of the considerations you should kind of review before you get started when uh, dealing with OpenStack and automation. Um, I'm actually going to demo uh, some examples of how you can use some open source uh, software to help with the automation with OpenStack. Um, I, I weren't able to do all the ones that I wanted, but I was able to uh, create a, a demo using Heat, kind of showing you what Heat does with the automation as well as with Ansible. Um, and I wasn't able to get one ops working, even though that was my uh, original thing that I was going to do, but that's a whole other story. But we can talk later if you want to know more about one ops and maybe even Terraform, which is another uh, platform you can use to automate things with OpenStack. And then at the la a very last topic we're going to cover is talking about the benefits of adopting what I call an administration DevOps state of mind. Um, so we've heard of DevOps, but uh, imagine taking DevOps and then putting in more of an administrator or operator role on it and how you can do some of those things. Okay. So I'd like to start out my presentation with this uh, uh, comic here uh, because to me it, it resonates, you know. So you know, you 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 fought tooth and nail to your leadership to get them to go with an OpenStack cloud. You've got it installed, you've got it configured, and then the next thing is, well, now what? What is the next step? You know, everyone says to themselves, well, cloud is supposed to be easy, right? And cloud is easier than virtualization, but there is still a level of work that you have to do to get your, your cloud to function in a way that you would like. Um, so I always use this, you know, just joke of how they moved everything to the cloud and he lost the number to the cloud guy, so basically that cloud is lost, right? So you don't want to lose your cloud. Um, and, and what you'll find is that there are many decisions that you're going to have to make when you first adopt and bring on to a cloud into your organization. You know, what kind of security? How am I going to set up the networks? Uh, you know, am I going to do isolation? Am I going to do continuous delivery? Am I going to do infrastructure as code? How do I set up my projects? Creating users? On and on and on, right? So there's tons and tons of decisions you have to make once you start to adopt cloud within your organization. Um, so th my best uh, advice I'm going to give to you, and you, we'll talk more about it later, is, is take time to make those framework decisions and stick to those decisions ahead of time. But we're going to talk more about, about that uh, and, and some of those decisions you're going to have to make. Um, I, I use this slide to primarily show that, you know, we all know OpenStack, right? That's why we're here at OpenStack Day. I'm not going to give you OpenStack one-on-one. But the idea of being able to abstract all the uh, uh, bare metal control and allowing it op uh, OpenStack to kind of manage it, and of course we know OpenStack has APIs and CLIs and a dashboard that's enablement, right? So OpenStack has kind of changed the way you look at cloud, to change the way you, you change the way you manage your bare metal servers. And, you know, OpenStack does love automation because it, it is API enabled out of the box. It's CLI enabled out of the box, right? Um, there's not many tools that are automatically have all that functionality built into APIs right out of the box. So the, the idea here is that the hard work is done for you already. Now all you have to do is consume OpenStack in, in, its, native for, in its native fashion. So before you get started to develop your automation plan with OpenStack, these are just some of the things that I've found to be very useful. Um, I've been in IT for a long time. I've dealt with a lot of different enterprise organizations. And the, the biggest takeaway that I find is having, having a plan ahead of time. And not just having a plan, but being able to set goals, objectives, and plan outcomes for that automation that you're trying to set up. You know, are you going to set up a workflow to be able to allow uh, uh, internal teams to provision resources? Um, you know, uh, uh, are you going to set up a framework that everyone in your organization is going to leverage in the same way? So being able to have a plan and set those goals and those plan outcomes is going to make a big difference. The second part that I've also found to be very useful is making those framework decisions. Am I going to leverage APIs? Am I going to use the CLI? Um, you know, uh, you know, how am I going to go about setting up the automation? What automation tools am I going to use, right? Those are more framework type decisions you need to make. And the key is, is not just to make those decisions, but to stick to those decisions. 
You know, there's always, make, there's always room to make uh, uh, provisions for unique situations. But the more you do that, the more less standard your environment becomes, right? So it's very hard to manage a very large environment when you have one-offs all over the place. So being able to make those framework decisions ahead of time and then sticking to them will actually ease the, the process of being able to create your automation. And that kind of goes into the third point, which is code consistency. By making those framework decisions and sticking to them, your code can be consistent. And code consistency creates uh, adoption to, of your code a lot easier. If you create uh, automation code and it's very difficult and very hard to follow and it's very different, every one of them, people won't use it. And that's just the reality of it, right? If it does not make sense to people, it won't, they won't use it. So having code consistency when you're creating your automation code will create an easier adoption for people to use. Um, and, and some of the other possible considerations that I've also find, you know, when, when dealing with automating things around OpenStack, you know, defining environment variables, right? So that sounds like a very trivial thing, you know, defining environment variables. What is, you know, is that really important to me? Well, it actually is, right? Because you have many ways of defining variables in your code. And, you, and obviously, you will always want to go about creating automation code that uh, is not hard coding values, right? You want to be able to pass values to it through variables. Do you define those variables locally? Do you define them globally? You know, there's a lot of different ways of kind of approaching this, but these are things that you should keep in mind. Again, they're trivial things, they're small decisions, but making those decisions ahead of time is going to make a world of a difference. Do I use the OpenStack API or do I use the CLI? And um, some people will judge me because I use the CLI to write a lot of my automation code, um, primarily because uh, I'm dealing with uh, Linux-based systems and it's running on Ubuntu and it's really easy for me. But the reality is, is you have the option, right? You can write your automation code against the APIs or you can use the CLI. Um, but having a standard or making a choice in your organization around how you're going to do that is the part that's going to play off. And then one of the last things that I found is, well, where do you run your code from, right? Do you have your code sitting in a central repository like GitHub or something local in your organization? Do you, do you remotely execute the code against your environments? Again, very trivial, small decision to make, but a very important decision that will make a big difference in the long term. So these are just some of the things that I like to share uh, with individuals who are kind of going down that path of, now that I have that OpenStack cloud, now what is the next phase to do with it? I can't say it enough, the fact that if you're not automating things within your OpenStack cloud, if you're not automating provisioning things within OpenStack, then you're not using OpenStack to its fullest potential, right? We all can go and pull up Horizon and click buttons and launch instances and create networks. All that is great but you're not gonna get the full potential of out of your cloud, specifically if your cloud grows to be a thousand node compute. Let's say, for example, your cloud is a thousand nodes, right? A thousand compute nodes in your cloud. You're not gonna be able to manage that environment from within Horizon. You're going to have to automate. You're going to have to create uh, some sort of automation code to be able to ease the administration as well as the operation of that cloud. So, uh, you know, we're, we're just speaking from uh, Rackspace experience around, we are one of the largest cloud operators, we are the cloud, largest open site cloud operator there is. And these are some of the experiences that we've just found to be very useful. So let's uh, kind of go into some of the demos, right? Some of the fun stuff uh, and actually show you some of the things that you can do. Um, if you've experimented with these things before, that's great. If not, uh, hopefully uh, I at least will share something new with you that you haven't seen before. So the first demo I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do is, is uh, turning your application stacks into code, right, with Heat. Um, if you're not familiar with Heat, um, Heat is obviously an OpenStack. You should be familiar with Heat if you're at an OpenStack day, right? So everyone should know what Heat is, right? I shouldn't have to tell you what Heat is, but I'm going to tell you anyway. So Heat is basically the orchestration service that is part of the OpenStack uh, umbrella. And it actually allows, and I call it the, the DevOps with training wheels is why I call it. And the reason why I call it that is that it's a very easy way to get started into writing automation code without having to do, uh, involve yourself in a separate uh, automation application such as a Chef or Puppet or Ansible or Salt, right? So Heat is built into OpenStack and the resource types that are created in Heat interface directly with the OpenStack services. So it knows exactly how to interface with the services. You don't have to go out and code and, and write code for it to figure out how to do that. So I actually like Heat a lot because of that reason. So imagine you're a cloud operator. So put, put on your cloud operator hat for a minute. Um, you are the guy who runs the cloud at your company. And uh, you want to be able to empower a team like QA with the ability to be able to stand up their own test environment. So a role of a QA uh, a person is, is they need to test code that they're given. In order to test that code, they usually have to have an environment for that to run on. 
So imagine the, being able to give the power of that QA person the ability to stand up uh, an environment that they can now deploy the code to and do their tests and then tear down later. So, um, you know, I want to demonstrate to you how I, you can do something like that in Heat and, uh, and show you how that works. So I'm going to jump out of this PowerPoint slide here and we're going to uh, go in and, and uh, do some fun stuff here. Um, and let me know if this stuff is uh, big enough to see because, uh, uh, well, is that more visible? More visible. I don't know if that's a proper English or not. <laughs> um, so hopefully this is quasi visible. So what I'm doing is is I have some. Uh, hey, sure. No problem. You want to join me? Sure. We can co-present. <laughs> so what I have here is uh, I store a lot of uh, things on GitHub, um, primarily because this is easy for me to kind of share with individuals. And feel free to check me out on GitHub. My username is wbentley15. And I have some sample uh, OpenStack heat templates up here. And the template I'm showing here is actually a template that I put together uh, that I use for a lot of customer demos. And the idea around this template is, is that it's going to actually spin up five different instances. It's going to create sec multiple security groups for each of those instances. So we have web app and a database tier. It's going to create multiple uh, load balancers. It's going to take those instances and add those to load balancer pool, as well as it's going to um, it's going to do something else. I don't remember what else it's going to do now. I tell you, I'm sorry, I'm jet lagged still, so you, I have to apologize. Um, but it's going to basically demonstrate. Oh yeah, it's going to create networks as well and attach those instances to the networks. Okay, and the reason uh, this example is is not that extravagant, but it's something simple and straightforward to show that I'm actually able to be able to give this hot template to a QA person, and all they have to do is create that stack over and over again. They never have to write any automation code. They never have to know anything super technical, right? They can go into Horizon Dashboard, uh, fill in the, 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 the possible parameters that they need to pass, and then hit enter, and it goes off and does what it does, right? So I won't, we're not going to do a line-for-line -line code review here, because that, that would not be a very, very uh, uh, good demo-like. But I'm going to log into uh, my OpenStack environment that I have running here. Um, and I basically do all-in-ones. Uh, I, I, I basically install all-in-one on our public cloud. So we're actually doing quadruple O. So it's OpenStack on top of OpenStack on top of OpenStack on top of OpenStack. Right? But again, I would never recommend you do this in real life. This is just for demo. Uh, so don't ever attempt this, please. But um, it works uh, great for demos. Right? So if I go into Horizon and I go to launch a stack, and I'm going to point to the hot template that I was just showing you guys. And as well as I'm going to give it an environment file, because quite honestly, uh, I don't want to type in all the parameters that I need to pass, because it's just, you know, it's pretty tedious, especially when you're talking about adding networks and things like that. And subnets, you have to provide that information. So I'm using an environment file that has a lot of that stuff pre-populated. Um, and then I'm just going to uh, give it a quick name here. Um, I'm going to tell it to roll back on failure, which is another wonderful feature that I love about Heat, is that if the Heat template or the stack that you're creating fails, it'll actually roll back and, they re and delete all the resources and things that it created. So you won't have uh, these, uh, these things kind of hanging out there that you're not using anymore. So definitely utilize that feature. Um, I'm going to just select some flavors here. I'm going to do small because, again, this is a demo environment and I don't have many resources. I'm going to pick an operator system of Ubuntu. And you'll find that all the rest of the parameters that I need to pass are already pre-populated because I gave it an environment file, right? So now we're just going to hit launch, right? How easy was that, right? You don't have to be super uh, techy to be able to do those things. Um, another thing I love about Heat that actually is pretty cool is as you create it, if you, you create a Heat template that has a lot of resource types you're calling, it actually will create this really dynamic view that kind of scurries around. Um, you kind of like pull it, it just it runs around on you, yeah, it just does. Yeah, you have no control over it, it just does what it wants, right? Um, but the reality is, uh, it's pretty cool, right? So if you ever wanted to show your leadership something, you know, cool, like, look, I spun up this thing and the boxes, you know, they pop and they shake and they move around, so it's actually pretty cool. Um, but the reality is, is this guy is done now, right? So all those things that I said I needed, uh, you'll find that the instances that I needed to create are all here running. I have an app, a database, and web. Uh, servers, you'll find that it created the different security groups that I needed, an app security group, a DB security group, and you can see that I have custom rules in here for this DB, uh, which happens to be MySQL. I have 3306 as support that I enabled for that ingress traffic. Um, if you go over and look at the network, you see that I have a private and a public network connected through a router. 
and you see those instances are kind of hanging off that network and of course the router that was created there. Um, and then the last piece of the puzzle, you'll go and look at the load balancer. So you'll see that I have two load balancer pools that were created. You see that those servers that I created are now members of those pools, right? So I was able to do all those things like that, right? And so basically the idea of being able to write that automation code once and then reuse it and run it thousands of times over and over again. And this is this really small, trivial example of what you can do with heat. Again, uh, you know, you can take it to the, to the next level and make really complicated things, um, but it all works the same way, right? So I'm going to go in, I'm just going to delete this because uh, we're going to do some other stuff. Um, and if you don't know this about heat, is that when you delete the stack, it actually deletes all the resources that it created in that stack. So everything goes away. Um, so you don't have to go and chase things down. And side note, don't ever delete a stack that you want to keep the resources of because it will delete the resources. So you got to keep the stack there if you're going to keep using it. The environment. All right, so while that deletes, we'll go back to the next one. So the next demo I'm just going to show is around um, being able to, or showing how we can automate different cloud administration tasks. And uh, this one kind of fell near and dear to my heart primarily because I've been production, I was in production support for many years. I was an administrator of many different types of systems. And I was always trying to figure out a way how I can automate that work so that I can do less work and, uh, <laughs> and maybe sleep more. And so, you know, uh, yeah, I had the choice, right? Either automate things or sleep less. So I chose to automate things so I can sleep more. Um, and I happened to fall in love with um, Ansible um, primarily for, for a few reasons, and I'll give you my reasons. Number one is it, Ansible is agentless, right? So you don't have to install an agent on the machines that you want to manage with Ansible, right? All you need is SSH. Literally, all you need is SSH, and Ansible can manage that machine. And when I say manage it, it can do configuration management, it can do um, uh, install software, it can, it can install OpenStack for you, which is why our OpenStack Ansible uh, project came about. Um, another thing I love about Ansible is that the base of Ansible is written in Python, which is also the same base as OpenStack, which is written in Python. So you find that they, they kind of behave the same way, so it actually makes sense to me. And, and I, I created this diagram just to kind of show how I, how I kind of came about working with uh, Ansible as a cloud operator, uh, writing that Ansible code and being able to leverage the OpenStack environment. And then at the end, all you have is your cloud consumers who are just be consuming all the things that you created within that environment with Ansible. So imagine now putting on your cloud operator hat again. Uh, what if you were tasked with creating 50 users and projects? Now again, that sounds simple, right? Oh, 50 users, no big deal. I'll go into Horizon, click about a million times, or I'll go into the CLI and enter about at least 50 commands, right? If not more, because creating users and projects are two separate different commands. Um, how long would that take, right? How long would that take you, imagine if that was your job function, how long would that take you to do that every day? And then also keeping in mind that you just can't create a password of one, two, three. It has to be a password that meets your company's organization's uh, password, right? So it has to be eight characters. It has to be uh, alphanumeric, right? So imagine having to do that for 50 users. Um, and then what if, uh, at the end of the day, you had to do more than that? You had to create custom quotas for each of those 50 users. Again, you could spend your whole day doing that within your cloud. Or... You can write some automation code, right? Write the automation code once and run it a thousand times over and over again. So now we're going to jump into the command line here. Um, so basically, same thing out on GitHub. I have some other uh, Ansible playbooks. Um, this one actually was taken from the OpenStack Summit that I did in Tokyo, the workshop I did. And uh, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to execute an Ansible playbook that's going to go out and create a series of users for me. And not just create a series of users, but create a series of users, create projects, assign them to roles, and also create passwords, and then give me those passwords that is created for those users in one, uh, one uh, output, right? So again, imagine how long it would take for you to do that if you were doing it by hand. Uh, we're going to just write some code. We're going to use some code here to do it for us. And is that visible? Should I try to make it bigger? Is that better? No? What's that? Oh, you can't see the blue. Sorry. Uh, well, the good news is, is that if this works, you won't have to worry about blue. How about that? If it works. Um, so I'm going to execute a uh, command here. If you're not familiar with Ansible, I uh, definitely would recommend you take a look at it. I have found to be very successful with managing OpenStack um, and many other things, right? 
Um, so what this Ansible playbook is going to do now is it basically is going to install a password generator. It's going to generate the passwords that I need. It's going to create 10 users for me. Then it's going to go out and create the 10 users environments for me. Again, you could be having coffee right now. You could be talking to your friend. Five minutes, no problem. That's good. Uh, you know, you could be on the phone, you know, saying, you know, talking to your wife, right? You're not, you, you're working right now, right? Remember, it's doing all the hard work for you. And then at the end, ta -da, ta da at the end, it gives you this output that basically shows you the user that was created to what tenant that he was assigned to or project and then the password that was associated with him. And you could basically copy that whole block at the end here, all in the green, and put that into a file and say, okay, I've created your users, and here's the passwords and information for them. And just so that you don't think that I'm uh, doing smoke and gun, and I really didn't create those environments, I'm gonna show you that those 10 user environments are now here. The users are as well as they're here, right? So again, this is just one really quick easy example of how you can do uh, 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 something with Ansible. I'm going to show you one other quick uh, demo as well. Um, and this is actually a playbook that actually is part of the book that I wrote um, that uh, is there for you guys if you're interested. Um, and with this example, I'm basically uh, going to demonstrate how I can do a cloud health check uh, dynamic cloud help check uh, right from a, one command. So, oh, I'm sorry. Don't worry about the blue. The blue is important. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I apologize. Um, it's running now, so I can't stop it. But <laughs> So what this script is doing, or this playbook is doing now, is it's actually going out and literally sprawling my whole cloud environment, checking all the services, checking to make sure that everything is functioning and actually going to give me back a status report that I can then look at and say, okay, all my services are running. Um, I checked MySQL, I checked RabbitMQ, I checked all those things, and this is the output of the report. Uh, so I just need to grab that so that I can cut down on my time since I'm running out of time. And what this is, is this just shows you a complete report of all the services that are running your hypervisors that are listed, networks that are available, var basically validating those services. And then it jumps into every services container, because OpenStack Ansible runs the services and containers, and lets you know the status of each process that's running on your server. Again, something that is just another sh small example of what you can do with just writing automation code around Ansible. Can you show how complicated the, the playbook is? Sure. I can. I, I, I absolutely can. Um, I would love to. Um, so uh, if, you, if you're interested in seeing these playbooks that I showed here, uh, under the GitHub repository of os-admin-with-ansible, that's actually the GitHub repository that that's, uh, goes with my book. So if you bought my book, you would know that that's the repository that goes with it. <laughs> I'm giving it to you as a, uh, as a complimentary, um, but you can go in here uh, into this repository, which is open to anybody, and take a look. So if I show you the, one of the roles um, that, I, that I wrote uh, for what I just ran, uh, you'll see that um, the code is actually very simple, right? So this is one of the roles. This, this, this role will go off and check all the OpenStack services that are running in your cloud and provide the status. Very simple. Ten lines of code. Uh, very simply can, uh, can do that for you. And, of course, I have it where it has some variables that I pass to it. And the variables are things that dynamically change, but this is why I'm telling it all the services to go after and look, whether it be Nova Compute, Nova Scheduler, Nova API, Neutron, et cetera, et cetera. And I list out all the processes to go and check, and then you run that code. I can change these variables to any process I want or any series of processes. Right? So that's the power of the, remember we talked about environment variables. Um, I can't show you all of them because I think that I'm going to get uh, uh, boot off the stage shortly, but uh, uh, you know, this is another um, role. Uh, again, 22 lines of code, not anything major. And the thing about Ansible that I didn't mention is that the code is written in YAML, which is a standard markup language, so you don't have to learn another programming language. Uh, again, it reminds you very much of, of dealing with the OpenStack CLI. Okay? All right. I'm uh, wrapping up. I'm sure I'm past my five-minute mark. No? Okay. I promise. I'm done. Um, kind of done. 
I'm gonna be like the other guys. So no, um, so I'm, I didn't get a chance to really kind of go through the cloud lifecycle with you guys, but again, I'm going to save my presentation and send it so that you guys can look at it uh, offline in your own time. But the biggest takeaway I just wanted to make sure to tell you guys is automate everything when it comes to OpenStack, and, and I do mean everything. The idea is do it once and then run it 100 times. You, there's no loss to that. Um, the other things to keep in mind is be an influence to the application design in your organization, right? Help them to be able to think about designing things in a cloudy fashion. And in order to be able to do that is make sure your applications can scale horizontally. Make sure they're designated to consume cloud resources, which are considered disposable resources. Um, make sure that you can try to create your applications to, to be in a stateless or share nothing state. And I know that's very hard to do with certain applications. Um, but there are tiers of application in your application that can be more stateless and not be dependent on uh, such things as uh, uh, very stateful things. Building a DevOps model, and of course, last but not least, the biggest thing I could ever tell you guys is make sure you build your applications to expect failures. Things are going to fail in your applications. There's no question about it. From an infrastructure layer, things are going to fail. But if you build your applications to expect certain levels of failure, um, it gets you much further uh, down the road and, and it improves your uptime in your applications, specifically around OpenStack. So anyway, we don't have time for QA probably, but I, I am here. I, uh, the Rackspace uh, table is right outside this room here. Feel free to stop by and give me your feedback or if you have any questions uh, about my presentation. But thank you. Thank you.